Amen. I like what I feel in this place. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to stand. We're going to read one passage of Scripture, and that is Philippians 3, 14. Many of you will know this Scripture. Philippians 3, 14 says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Brother David, would you pray, please, sir? Man, you may be seated this morning. On August the 7th, 1954, during the British Empire Games in Vancouver, Canada, one of the greatest one mile matchups in history took place. Only two men to break a four minute mile were to compete against each other. One of them's name was Roger Bannister, and the other was John Landy. They were in a race that was billed the Miracle Mile. These two men, the fastest men on the planet to run a mile, were pitted against each other to run what is known as the Miracle Mile. Both men were in peak condition. It was the prime of their competitive careers. Landy led the race by a couple of strides, though most of the race banister was forced to alter his strategy just to barely keep up. During the third lap, Landy started to pull away from Bannister, and Bannister had to force and had to begin to kick start earlier than he wanted to to even maintain to stay in the race with Mr. Landy. Then came one of track history's most famous moments, Brother David. One stride, one stride away from home stretch. With the noise of the crowd filling his ears, he couldn't hear the footsteps of Bannister behind him. And he looked over his shoulder one time to see where his opponent was. And at that backward glance was all it took for the momentum of Bannister to shoot by Landy as he faltered. Roger Bannister ended up winning the race by a mere five yards. And Landy's lap serves as an example of what the author of Hebrews had to say. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore seeing we are compassed about or compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If he would have just had a little more patience, he was in sight, Sister Maria of the finish line. He was on the home stretch. He led the whole race, Brother Pete. He was running with everything that was in him. Everything he was running. He led the race, but in the home stretch, he decided to look back to see where his opponent was. And by merely looking back, he lost the race. By merely looking back, he gave up his lead and lost the race. It's a proven fact that whatever direction you look, Brother Jackie, is which way you're going to go. Whatever way your eyes look, Brother Chris, is what direction you're going to go. Believe me, I know this for a fact. You can ask my wife because when my kids, Brother Brother David, begin to get ornery in the back seat and I turn around to give them a good smack or something, I hear the old rumbling of of the side of the road. And she's like, get her back on the road. Because my eyes ain't looking where I need to be going. My eyes are looking behind me. And when I look behind me, Brother Pete, I don't go the direction that I'm supposed to go. I know a lot of this new finangled farm equipment. Brother Jackie, you don't have to have your eyes on a target anymore. You can set it and forget it. But back in the old days, Brother Pete, you had to focus on something. You had to maintain some integrity and, and look where you wanted to go. You had to keep your eyes on the prize. And just for a little bit today, I like to talk about that, keeping your eyes 
on the prize. Your eyes are on the front of your face for a reason. They help us focus. They help us to see things that are in front of us. It helps us to judge distance. It helps us to know what's coming our way. It helps us to see what direction we're going and what direction we're headed in. It helps us navigate obstacles that get in our way. As a, as a young child, we can watch them. When they first begin to walk, we can watch. When they walk to something and they grab a hold of it, and pretty soon they learn, wow, that hurts if I bump up against that. So I'm going to learn to move out of the way a little bit. In the middle of the night, if you've ever worked midnights and you come in early in the morning and your wife's done rearranged the house a little bit and you walk in where the coffee table used to be, it ain't there anymore, and you hang your little toe, you realize that what I can't see can hurt me. What I can't see and what I don't know is there can destroy me if I don't pay attention to the direction that I'm going. I've always got to keep my eyes on the prize. I know I, my grandpa told me a story about his team of mules that they had when he was young and, and how sometimes when, when one of them would get ornery, they'd put little blinders on them. Brother Pete, what's them blinders for? So I can't see what's going this way, and I can't see what's going that way, but I can focus on the job that is at hand. Sometimes we need some spiritual blinders on our eyes because we allow ourselves to focus on what's left. We allow ourselves to focus on what's on the, on the right side or what's on the left side, and we don't keep our eyes on the place that God would have us to. We don't look toward the direction that he is leading and guiding us. By our very genetic makeup, we're designed to go where we look. That's the reason we should always ask God, Brother David, for guidance. That's the reason we should always keep our eyes on him, always look to him because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He will lead us and he will guide us and he will direct us. I told Brother David and him this morning as I was reading my Bible this week, one of the things that really stuck out to me that I've never noticed before was Joshua. And Joshua came into the, the country of Israel, the nation, the Canaan land that God had promised him. And God told Moses and God told Joshua that I want you to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. Everybody. And I'm going to give you of the spoils of the land. I'm going to give you this land. You're not going to have to do anything. Nothing. Just walk in, overtake them, and it's yours. But because they did not ask counsel... At the mouth of the Lord, Joshua 9 and 14, they unknowingly made a peace treaty with the enemy. They came into a city of Gibeon, and there was a group of people there that had heard of the mighty exploits of God. They had heard how God had led them out, how God had directed them, how God had kept them. And they said, we, we cannot be overtaken. We're scared for our lives. So what we're going to do, is we're going to put on some old ragged clothes. We're going to take some bread and we're going to shove it down in our sacks that's moldy and nasty and we're going to fill up wine and some wineskins that's busted and broken and look like they have 100 years old. And they put them on their shoulders and they begin to walk toward the children of Israel. And when they met the children of Israel, they told them we're from a faraway land. They didn't let them know that we're just from right over there. Well, we're from a faraway land, Brother Johnny. Look, we've even got moldy bread because we traveled so far. We've even got torn up clothes because we've come so far. We've even got old wineskins because the journey has been so strenuous and through deceit. Because they did not ask counsel of the Lord, they made a peace treaty with the enemy. So many times in our life we make decisions based on what we want to do, Brother David, instead of asking counsel of the Lord. We make decisions and we dig ourselves into a hole because we think we know best. We think we know what we need to do. We think, I'm big enough, I can do what I want, I'm grown. How many of y'all have heard that before? If you've had children, you've heard it. If you've been a child, you've probably said it or at least thought it. I'm big enough, I can do what I want. I, can, I know what's best for me. Nobody knows me like I know me. I can do what I want. So when I begin to do what I want, because I think I'm grown, and I cease to ask counsel of Almighty God, I begin to veer in a path that I have no business going. 
I begin to walk down a path that I have no business going. And all along, if I would have just asked counsel of God Almighty, he would have directed me and would have kept me and would have led me into a direction that would have preserved me and that would have strengthened me. But I thought I knew best. I thought I knew what direction that I should go. Brother G.L. made mention not too long ago about the New Trans Living Translation Bible. And I got me a copy of it on the app on my phone, and it's, it's very easy to read, Brother David. It puts it down in, in our vernacular, dumbs it down for somebody like me sometimes, so I don't have to have a dictionary to figure out what they're saying. But I'll, I'll begin to read a passage of Scripture that the Lord had laid on my heart. And this passage of Scripture, I thought I understood what it said. I thought I knew what it meant until I broke out the other day sitting in my chair and I began to read this. Psalm 73. We're going to go through 1 through 17. And this is the New Living Translation. And this is David. Everybody knows, I mean Asaph. Everybody knows of this story. They know of this psalm that Asaph wrote. And it says, truly God is good to Israel. To those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping. I was almost gone, for I envied the proud when I what? When I saw them prosper. How do you see without looking? How do you? See them prosper if your eyes are not affixed to an individual. If you're not looking at people. How do you see them? He said, I saw them prosper despite of their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and so strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everybody else. They wear their pride like a jeweled necklace and they clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and they speak evil only. In their pride they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at all these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but troubles all day long and every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I, have, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand. Brother David, I, I, I looked at people. I got mad because it looked like they were being blessed. And I'm trying to do right. I've done this, Lord. Check number one. I've done this, God. Check number two. And I'm the one that's suffering. I'm the one that's going through hurt and pain. And they've got it made. How is that possible? I tried to understand what I saw. I tried to understand what I was focused on. You see where I'm going with this? I tried to understand what I was looking at. Why the whispered wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. Then, I went into your sanctuary, O oh God. And then what's it say? I finally understood. When I knelt down at the altar, God, and explained to you how upset I am and how I don't understand what I'm looking at, and I take my eyes for just a little bit off of what I'm staring at and focus on you, I now understand 
what I've been going through. I now understand that you've placed them upon a slippery slope. I now understand that what I thought was blessings were really curses because they don't have a clue what they're standing on. They don't have a clue what they're going through. But now I understand because I'm looking to you. Now I understand because my eyes are no longer on people. But they're on you, Lord. Don't Asaph's quote here in the Bible, don't that sound familiar, Brother David, to us? Don't that sound like something we'd say? I'm mad, God, because I don't understand what you're doing. I'm mad, God, because you're blessing them. They've got this, this, and this, and look at me. I'm upset. I'm mad. All these things that you promised me, where are they at, God? I don't see them. We sound just like the children of Israel. We're happy that God brought us through the Red Sea. Three days later, we're complaining because we're thirsty. Then I'm happy that I got water. Then I'm hungry, so he gives me manna. Then I'm mad because all I've got is manna, and he gives me quail. Then I gripe because I'm thirsty again. All of my life is complaining and griping because I'm looking at things I have no business looking at. I'm gazing at things I have no business gazing at, and I'm wondering why and how on earth God has forsaken me. When all along, if I just turn my eyes to him and begin to look to him, the author and the finisher of my faith, for once in my life, I will begin to understand where I'm standing. He's placed me up on a rock, Brother Pete, that's higher than I am. I can't see where I'm going, God, but you've placed me up on a place of shelter. No matter what I think I'm going through, you're with me, and you're leading me, and you're guiding me, and you're directing me. When Asaph had his eyes on other people, he was falling. But when he went to the house of the Lord, he finally understood the destiny of the wicked. He finally understood what he was going through. He finally understood what he thought he knew all along. And this is that. When we gaze at things that are minimal, we falter. When we look at the faults of others, we falter, Brother David. If I judge myself among myself, I falter. I wish I was taller. Man, I wish I had a hair like him. I wish I was pretty as her. Every girl that I know that has curly hair wish their hair was straight. Every girl I know that has straight hair wish their hair was curly. Blonde-headed wants dark hair. Dark hair wants blonde hair. We're not content with who we are because we stare at ourselves every day and we nitpick every flaw that we have. And we see ourselves as, I'm not as beautiful as somebody else. I'm not as pretty as somebody else because I stare at myself and I nitpick my whole life. And I dig myself into a hole because my eyes are on flaws and failures instead of him. But if for one minute, I can begin to look to him and say, God, you've given me strength. You've, you've given me health. You've blessed me. You've protected me. You've kept me. You know, I begin to understand, you know, it's really not that important. I remember praying, Brother Jackie, when I was little. Sitting, I'll never forget it. Where I was sitting at, I was drawing and painting in art class. Never forget it. Brother Johnny, I'm sitting there painting, doing my thing for class, and here comes a girl. Pecks me on the shoulder. She said, Bobo, you going bald. I said, what? She said, you're going bald-headed. I said, I ain't going bald-headed. That's just how my hair is fixed. She said, no, you're going bald. So I got home, like every guy, and broke the mirror out, and I'm looking, trying to figure out, yep, it looks like it's getting thin. But I ain't going bald. God, please don't let me go bald like my dad, Lord. Please don't let me be like my grandpa. God, please, Lord Jesus, don't let me be bald. I was praying for something that was inevitable. It was going to happen. I didn't want it to happen, but it was going to happen. Then I got to a point in my life, I said, well, I can flip it all over to the side, or I can just peel it off. Then I got to thinking, you know, it's vanity anyways. It really don't matter. What's the big deal? I said, okay. So I'll peel it off. Sit there in my chair and my baby girl walks in and starts crying. She's scared to death. Don't even know who's sitting in a chair. She's crying. She's upset because for the first time in her life, daddy don't look like daddy no more. And she's scared. 
That really made me feel good. But I realized... Brother Pete, that some of the things that I'm facing in my life, some of the decisions that I see in the mirror, that I, the, the, the things that I see that, that I think are failures really don't matter to a hill of beans. That's life. One foot's bigger than the other one. One finger's longer than the other one. One ear's higher than the other one. Does that matter? One eye's squinty and one eye's open. Does it really matter? No, it don't. Because to the eyes of my children, they love me like I am. You think they're going to remember dad's bald-headed with a squinty eye or dad's got this or dad's got that or, or mom had this? No, they ain't going to remember that. But they're going to remember the times you knelt down and you hugged them and you kissed them. They're going to remember the times that you wiped the dirt off of their leg and their busted knee and you fixed it up and said, it's going to be okay. That's the things you're going to remember. And that's the things we have to remember. That when we're looking in the mirror of life and we're judging ourselves amongst ourselves. And I wish I could preach like Brother GL. I wish I was good at this like this one. I wish I had the knowledge Brother David had. And I begin to judge myself amongst everybody else. I will belittle myself to the point where I don't even feel worthy to do what God has called me to do. I will belittle myself to the point where I can't even look at myself in the mirror without condemning my own self. Because I see nothing but failure. I see nothing but flaws. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that to make myself look better. Because all I see is failure. But God said if you just get your eyes off of yourself, off of everybody else, and fix your eyes to me, you're going to see a whole new world. You're going to see a whole different outlook than what you're seeing right now. But you have to turn your gaze to me. You have to look to me. When we look in any other direction than the leading and the unction of the Holy Ghost, we will fail. Children of Israel, a case in point. We look at them and we think, Sister Maria, how ignorant can you be? I thought that myself. How ignorant can you be? God destroyed the Egyptians in front of you. He led you by a pillar of fire. And he led you by a cloud. He parted the Red Sea and allowed you to walk through on dry ground and you're still complaining. How ignorant can you be? And then I look in the mirror, and I think, how ignorant can you be? And I start thinking about all the things God has done for me. This just as great as what he did for the children of Israel, Brother Manning. All the things that he's led me through that nobody knows about. I sit at Tasters one night and begin to tell Sister Maria and Sister Kim some of the things that's happened in this boy's life that a lot of people don't know about. Me and Ashley begin to tell them about some things that God has done for us. And I thought to myself, at the time, you don't realize it. But I thought, the older I got, how ignorant was I not to realize what God was doing in my life. Or how hard-headed and hard-hearted was I to push him to the side because I wanted to do my own thing. He's the same God. If you think for one minute that God still don't work miracles, then you're sadly mistaken. If you think for one minute that God still don't care about your well-being, then you're sadly mistaken because he loves you and he cares about you and he cherishes you. You know as well as I know your children. There's not one that you love better than the other one. You treat them all different because they all act different. You treat them different because each and every one of them do things different. One of them is more loving. One of them is smarter. One of them does this better. One of them is more athletic. But do you love them any less? No. You nourish the things that are important to them. You nourish the, the, the things that are in them. You nourish the things that is inside them that God has placed with them. You begin to tell them, hey, you, you're going to be mighty. I tell Scarlett all the time. She'd probably be embarrassed right now if I told you. But I've knelt down at the bed. I've prayed for her at night. I've prayed for Sophie at night. i prayed for Colton at night. And I tell them, God's going to use you. I don't know how, I don't know why. I don't know what direction he's going to lead you in, but God is going to use you. 
God is going to use you, and I'm going to pray a covering and a hedge over you that somehow, some way, one day you wake up and realize that God has a plan for your life because I gave him to you. You are his. You're not mine. He allowed you, allowed me to let you just live in my house for a little bit, to correct you, to lead you and guide you. But ultimately, he's the one that's going to lead you. Ultimately, he's the one that's going to set you up on a place that daddy can't take you, and he's going to use you. He's going to direct you. And he's going to guide you. The most important thing in your life is realizing that you've got a purpose. So many people, Brother Billy, they, they wake up in the morning, i got to go to work. They're hard workers. They get up every morning at the same time. I know hundreds of them. Every morning, get their cup of coffee, kiss their babies and their family goodbye, and off to work, and they work long hours, and they work hard. And they come home and they, they play with their kids when they don't feel like playing with their kids. They hug their kids when they don't feel like hugging their kids because they're wore out. And they take a shower and old dad lays down and he's tired. And baby, the dryer's messed up. Babe, the washing machine's water's going all in the floor. And you get up and you walk in here and you think, really? I mean, really, Lord? I mean, there's water going everywhere in the floor and... I'm trying to go to bed, but that's, that's how things happen. Life. Life happens. And if we allow it, if we focus on those things, we'll be in a pit till we can't dig ourselves out of it. We'll just, woe is me, God. But I remember my grandpa all, all of my life, man. I watched him. Watched him battle things, watched him go through things. My dad, same way. With a smile on their face. And I'm thinking, man, how in the world do you laugh through stuff like that? How do you smile through things like that? I watched him in the morning. Hey, good morning, he said. Four o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking, man. Now I'm that. Hey, good morning. And Ashley's thinking, man. <laughs> Woke her up the other day. I said, hey, how are you doing? She just looked at me like, really? This is what you want to do at 630? Really? But that's just me because I am truly thankful. If you've known what some of the things I've been through, you understand why I'm thankful. Why I praise him like I praise him. And why I don't care what people think about me anymore. I used to be that person, Brother Pete, that wanted to be cool, that, that really thought, you know, I can't act ignorant like that. I had one of my buddies tell me, if I come to your church, <laughs> I ain't acting like y'all people. Y'all's crazy. Y'all's nuts. But yet... He was the one that was doing all the crazy stuff. And his wife said, I thought you wasn't going to act crazy. He said, I don't know what got a hold of me. But I'm glad it did. Because when you realize that what you've been focused on, when you realize that the things of this life that, that were dragging you down because i got to work, i got to have this, you were made for so much more than what you think you're made for. You was not created to get up and work every day, even though we have to. That ain't why you was made. But on my way to work, at work, at home, at lunch, wherever I'm at, I can do what I was created to do. And that is be a witness to everybody that I come in contact with. That is worship the Lord, to praise the Lord, and to magnify his name. Because I was created to worship him. I was created to praise him. And when we realize... Brother Pete, that that's what we were made for. Being bald-headed with a squint eye, one ear bigger than the other, one foot, high waters. Y'all probably don't know nothing about no high waters, but my mom always bought our pants too long. She'd tuck them in and sew them up. So when they started riding a little high, she'd just undo the stitch and let them out. So now my light-colored Jeans had a big dark spot on the bottom, which was really cool in school. You know, Brother Billy, that was, that was the hip thing to do. Not. And I thought, really, I'll never do this to my kids. I'll never make my kids do this. And I thought to myself, if, Mom, you don't understand what I'm going through. And she thought, well, you really don't understand what I've been through. But I thought I was dying. Because at that point in time, that was the most important thing in life to me, was being cool at school. 
I thought life was over, man. What am I going to do when I graduate? All my friends, oh, God, I, I'm going to die. I, all my friends are going to be gone. And my whole world's ending. Then a couple years after that, or two or three years, everybody's moved off. You don't even really remember things anymore. You realize how petty your thinking was. Why? Because our eyes are focused on things that they had no business being focused on. We get focused in the now. We focus on what we can touch and what we can see. We don't realize that there is a plan for us. We don't realize that if we can just focus upon the Lord and look to Him, like I said, the author and the finisher of our faith, He will lead us and guide us in every direction that He wants us to take. Instead of us trying to feel around for what direction we feel is best for our life. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. There's nothing wrong with having hopes and dreams. But there is something wrong with kneeling down and saying, God, how about you give me some direction? How about you lead me and guide me and let me know what you want me to do because I can still be a doctor and make it to heaven, but I'll never make it to heaven unless I'm obedient to you. I'll never make it to heaven unless I walk the path that you've set for me because you've placed me up on a place. You have placed something in my life that I have to do. You're leading me and you're guiding me and I have to know the direction that you want me to take. See, healing for the blind man came when he set his sights on one he could not physically yet see. Think about that for a minute. Healing for that man. I can't physically see him, but he's there. I don't know where, but he's there. I heard he's coming. He's there. Well, you can't see him. Sit down. Hush. No, he's there, Brother Pete. Where is he at? Take me to him. Sit down. Leave him alone. He throws that beggar's coat off and said, no, where's he at? I want to see. And Jesus asked of him, what is it that you want? He said that I might receive my sight. He saw because he saw in faith. He saw physically because he saw in the spirit. He believed in faith. Faith is believing without seeing. Faith is believing without seeing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, it's believing on something even though we can't see it. Thomas believed because he touched the nail scars. He touched the hole in Jesus' side. He said, that's you, Lord. I, I believe it now. But Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Blessed are those who ain't seen me, but yet they're believing in me. You see, if you want to see miracles physically, you've got to start seeing with some faith. You've got to start looking outside of the box and what you can touch and what you can feel. You've got to start looking and get your eyes off of other people and start looking to the one that can lead you, the one that can open your eyes and allow you to see, amen. It's faith that's going to move the mountain. It's faith that's going to open your eyes. But you first have to set your eyes upon the master. You first have to look to him. You first have to look to him. You see, the only thing that keeps us from our goals is sin. The only thing. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but I sit back there and I watch every one of them kids in my class who sometimes they punch each other in the arm and pull hair, ain't paying attention, you think, Hush, be quiet. Hush, stop. Don't. Listen, I'm going to send you out there. And you think they ain't grasping anything, Brother Pete. But I sit there and watch them as I begin to talk to them about how sin separated them from the presence of God and how that angel was placed, Brother David, with that flaming sword in the, in the front of the Garden of Eden. God wasn't playing when he placed that angel there. He didn't just stick him there for looks. That was for a purpose. You ain't going back into my presence because sin has separated you from me. Sin separated a holy God from us. The only way that I can get back to that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a holy God is to humble myself, repent of my sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then, brother, brother Billy, I can walk 
back with him every day. I can talk with him every day. I can say, Lord, what direction do you want me to take? God, lead me. Guide me. Direct me, Lord Jesus. Keep me. Never leave me, God, but always keep me in your presence. Always guide me in the direction that you want me to go. Don't let me sin, God. Don't let me fall. Don't let me falter. Don't let me fail. But if I do, Micah 7 and 8 says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemies, for when I fall, I shall arise. When I make a mistake, I'm going to get up because I'm trusting in the Lord. When I fail, I'm going to get up, Brother Billy, because I trust in the one. I believe in the one that is able to protect me, to keep me, and to save me. I found this site on, on the Internet. And it talks about the key to overcoming besetting sin. It said the key to overcoming besetting sin is to keep your eyes fixed on the prize. You want to know why we fail and we give in to sin's temptation? It's because we shift our attention from God to the things we want. We shift our attention, whether by hurt, pain, whether by lust, whether by greed, whatever it is, we shift our attention off of a God that cares for us to gain satisfaction right now. Right now. I can touch it right now. I can feel it right now, but I, I, I want what's right now, but I'm going to have to take my eyes off of the one that I know loves me, that cares for me, that protected me, that created me. We shift our attention from God to the very thing we're being tempted with. Think about it. Every time we sin, at that time we sin, we're choosing to invest our great desire in sin other than God. We don't think about it at the time like that. Nobody thinks about it at the time like that. Well, I'm turning around and walking away from God because I want to do this. Most people don't act like that. It's just temptation, Brother David. The Bible says when we're tempted and brought about by our own lust, what we want, what this flesh wants. We blame a lot of stuff on the devil that's right here. It's this flesh. It's what we desire. We give him props for things he ain't got no business having props for because it's what we want. I want it. And because I sit and I ponder and I think about it and I think on it, I act on what I think about. You are what you eat and you become what you think about. Whatever a man's on the inside of him, that's what he's going to be. So we've got to take and make ourselves say, no. I told Scarlett the other day, I said, look, when things come into your mind, you've got to be the person that says, no, I'm not going to do that. When you begin to ponder on things, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's like a splinter that gets stuck in your hand. If you don't get that thing out, it's going to begin to fester. It's going to begin to get sore. It's going to begin to, to, to puss up because it's infected. And that's the same way your mind's going to be when you begin to allow things in your mind. You begin to think on things in your mind and you're not thinking on the things of God. You're not looking to the things of God. But you must keep your eyes upon the prize at all times. You must look to Jesus. You must keep your eyes upon Him because in the midst of your trial, He's the one you're going to need the most. He's the one you're going to need the most. As I said a while ago, at the moment we fall, the desire and the objects of our temptation at that present time, we wanted it more than God. We wanted it more than God. Do you think for one instance, Brother David, that Eve wanted to get kicked out of the Garden of Eden? It was a utopia. It was a perfect, perfect place. Everything they could ever want, peace, harmony, everything was great. You think they really wanted to get kicked out of there? No. But what happened was, one time, she listened. He said, just check that tree out over there. And she took her eyes off of God and what he told her. Don't you even go near that tree. Don't you look at that tree. And don't you partake of that tree. And she focused her eyes on the thing she desired the most. And when she focused her eyes and begin to think, the old devil slid in 
And he said, well, you know, really, God, that you're, you're, you're not going to die. If you do this, you're, you're not going to die. There's plenty of time. You've got time. Don't worry about it. You'll, you, you're, you can serve God when you're old. That's what most people do. When it comes time to about time for me to go, then I'll, then I'll serve you, Lord. Or I'll, I'll, I'll do it when I get ready, God. You know, when, when I do what I want to do, then, then I'll serve you. I'll look to you. Then I'll, I'll call upon you when I need you the most. But you ain't thinking of that at the time. You're just focusing on what I want right now. And because of this, she took her eyes off of God. And she listened to ungodly voices. And she was banished forever from the presence of a holy God. When we sit here at church on Sunday morning, so far away from the sin that besets us, we, do, we, we think of how foolish it was that I'd done that. How ignorant was I to do that? I, I, that was stupid. How many of y'all have ever done that? You made a mistake. Mama said, don't, don't you go in there and get that cookie. You know if I get the cookie, I'm getting a whooping. But yet that cookie looked so good. It smelled good. Sitting there on the stove and mm-hmm. move them around a little bit so maybe she don't know one's missing. Just kind of shift the pan a little bit. Mama said, I cooked 24 cookies and there's 23 cookies here. Where'd that cookie go? That's me, Mom. Get in the room. I told you if you got that, you was going to get a whooping. You see, that's, that's what we do. But at that moment, Brother Pete, that cookie looked so good that I took my eyes off of what I knew was going to happen to gain some temporary satisfaction. How many of y'all have your rock that Brother Cody give you? Hold that up just for a second if you got it. Just a rock, ain't it? The low hunk of rock or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to show you something. It's here. Some of you might know what it is. That's called a buckeye. How many of y'all know what a buckeye is? My little brother's got a buckeye tree in his front yard, and I picked a bunch of them up and gave them to some of the boys back here in the back, and I told them this story. This here is a buckeye. My grandpa told me, he said, this this thing here will keep old Arthur away. He said, but it's also good luck, you know, and he'd, he'd mess with me. I don't, I don't think it's good luck. And I sure don't think it'll keep Arthur away. But I do think that every time I reach in my pocket and I pick up this buckeye, I remember my grandpa talking to me. That's, that's why I keep this buckeye for it. Because when I pick it up and I look at it, I remember the things, Brother Billy, that he taught me. Walking in the garden behind him, looking at the chickens. I remember all those things. And all those memories flood back just from this little buckeye. It's amazing how a song or how something so minimal as that right there can bring back memories. Songs play on the radio. My dad said, oh, Lord, I remember where I was, 1969, right here, headed to Vietnam. Things like that bring back memories. And I thought, told the kids in the back, I said, look here, I don't believe in anything. Eli, Noah, all the rest of the boys, I said, I don't believe this thing will bring you luck. But one thing it will do, if you hang on to it and don't lose it, one day you'll reach in your pocket and you say, I remember Brother Bobo being back there. Whether I'm dead and gone or wherever I'm at, that will remind you of me. But here's what I want you to do today. This rock right here. A man discovered that he had a wealthy relative. Sister Callie, as you're coming. A man discovered he had a wealthy relative that had just recently died. He got the phone call that he was now the heir to a diamond mine. Man, he owns a whole legit diamond mine. He's a millionaire. He's got to go to it, but he's a millionaire. So he hops on a plane, and he flies toward the diamond mine. And while he gets on the plane, in the middle of the flight, a man shows up, comes and sits down beside him. He said, where are you headed? He said, man, I just found out that I'm the heir to a diamond mine. He said, no kidding. He said, well, I'm a multimillionaire, and I own a brick-making business. We make clay bricks. And he reached down in his little satchel, and he pulled a brick out, and he 
placed it in that man's hand. And he said, I'll give you a share in my company, a sure-fired way to make millions for your diamond mine. And that man began to think, is it worth it giving up what I haven't seen for something I can touch? His life that we live, he said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. He's making a place for us. But not only that place. Brother G.L. talked just not too long ago. It ain't just that place we can go to. But every single day that we live, every hour of every day, we can go to a secret place. When I don't feel good, God, I can call upon you and I can be transported to that secret place where me and him can commune one-on-one no matter what I'm facing. Me and him can talk, Sister Maria. We can be together. I can trade that promise for something that I can hold right now, something that I can touch right now, whether it be a boat, a car, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, money, job, whatever it is. That's what this symbolizes. That's what this is. Mark 8, 36 and 37 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What will you give? What will this rock be to you? Brother Pete, what will that be? Is a job worth my soul? Is is something that I cherish in this life worth the promise of something far greater? Luke 19 and 40 says this. The disciples were praising the Lord. They were magnifying Him. Hosanna, Hosanna, worthy. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. They were worshiping Him to the point where the Pharisees said, Y'all need to just hush. Be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you that if they should hold their peace, that these stones are going to begin to cry out. I want you to keep this stone in your purse, or men, in your pocket, like I carry that buckeye. And when you pick chains out of your pocket during the day, and you look down there and you see that rock, have I praised him today? Have I magnified him today? Because if I don't, there's a very good chance that this thing that I hold right here will take my place. He spoke this into existence, Brother Pete. And when he spoke it into existence, it's just there. But he created me. He's protected me. He's kept me. He's guarded me. He's blessed me. He didn't bless this rock. He blessed me. And I am never going to allow this rock to worship Him and to praise Him as long as I have breath, Brother Jackie, to say, God, you're worthy of all that I can give you. You're worthy of everything that is within me. Let every breath that I have in my body praise you and magnify you and never let this rock take my place. Every day that I live, Lord, let me me run my hand in my pocket. I'm going to see my grandpa But number one, let me see you. Let me remember, God, no matter what I'm going through, that I can praise you, that I can magnify you, that I can lift you up. If you would this morning, just come. Just come down here.